Jim McGregor from Tirius Research here at Hot Chips at Stanford University, talking with NVIDIA. Today I'm talking to Gilad Steiner, who is the Vice President of Networking at NVIDIA. Probably one of the most important jobs there is today. First off, thanks for joining me at this beautiful location here at Stanford University. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we always talk, you know, especially around AI, we're always talking about the, uh, the, the GPUs and accelerators and everything else. Um, quite honestly, it's the rest of the system that really makes everything work. It's the memory, it's the networking and everything else, especially the networking. And you guys have pretty much created what I would call the perfect scale up network with the uh, NVLink, you know, it, it's, it's fast, it's low latency, it's uh, coherent memory. Um, but, you know, it seems like every generation, somebody's looking for a new solution. You know, are there any real limits to NVLink? No, so, so NVLink was essentially built to, or designed to connect those GPU ASICs together and to be able to form one large GPU, for example, rec scale GPU. Now, NVLink has no scale limits, meaning you can decide to connect as many ASICs that you want. The way that we define how many ASICs we want to connect on a scale-up infrastructure is based on what workloads you would like to support in a most effective way. How do you build infrastructure that is optimized for performance, for performance per cost, for performance per power. And that's essentially determine how you want to build the infrastructure, what are the infrastructure building blocks on a scale up on, on NVLink, how do you want to connect those together, and in what way you want to package it. Um, today we are focusing NVLink on copper connectivity. We want to maximize copper connectivity because actually it's zero power consumption, so it's very cost effective, and it's a great solution to drive that massive amount of bandwidth that are needed or is needed between those GPU ASICs. So those elements determine the way that we want to build the infrastructure or to build the rack, the way that we want to create elements that, that builds NVLink, but in general for NVLink protocol, there is no limit to how many GPU ASICs you can connect with that protocol. That's a really good point because I know that some people said, well, it's only limited to 72 or a couple hundred GPUs. And that's really dependent on the network architecture. You know, you've created a star architecture for your NVL72, you know, rack, the GB200, GB300 rack. But that star architecture gives you some significant advantages in terms of deterministic uh, characteristics to be able to determine, you know, point A to point B. But you could do a mesh, you could do any type of network architecture, so there really is no limit to NVLink. No, to the to NVLink protocol, there is no limit. And and the number of GPU ASIC we put in a rack is part of designing the full data center. Okay, it's not that you go and design components and then you take components and you try to assemble something. It's like we design a data center, we start from the workloads that need to run and how the data center needs needs to look like what the data center needs to provide. And that will determine all the other elements, how many GPU ASICs you want to put on a scale up, what will be the size of the scale up, where it's going to be running, what media it's going to be used. It also determines the scale out connectivity, what you want to bring in a scale out connectivity to connect those racks together. And it's also determined the new infrastructure that we start to talk about, which is scale across. So it's not components, it's kind of building the entire data center. NVLink itself, it's great. It's, it supports massive amount of bandwidth, very deterministic performance, load and store operations, low latency, high message rate. Essentially, you're taking those ASICs and you get one GPU. That's great. And, you know, as we start looking at, you know, where we're going with this networking and everything else, um, you're also introducing NVLink Fusion. So it's not just limited to NVIDIA GPUs or NVIDIA CPUs. Uh, you can pretty much connect any component. So it is a true scale-up solution to pretty mm -hmm. much any compute unit, for that Correct. matter. Correct. So NVLink is not really a network, meaning I would not call NVLink a network. 
Mm -hmm. NVLink is a compute infrastructure. Yes. It's a scale up computing infrastructure. It's an extension of the GPU. And building an extension of the GPU to drive the performance needed on a scale up infrastructure with NVLink, it's very complicated task. And we built something which is so amazing and we want other people to leverage our technology, leverage what we built. And therefore with NVLink Fusion, you can take any GPU or any accelerator, any CPU, you can take both and actually bring that scale-out infrastructure, utilize that scale-up infrastructure to connect any accelerator, any CPU that you want to connect. You can choose different components as well. But that's actually enabled people to leverage from our technology, from what we developed. Uh, recently, by the way, there was an announcement with Fujitsu that they're taking NVLink Fusion and connect their own CPU to that NVLink Fusion. And with that, we are enabling Japan, enabling Fujitsu to bring AI supercomputers to Japan. That's awesome. Now, and one thing that's unique about NVLink, and I kind of want to bring this up because We've always, you know, most of the other solutions that are out there were developed as networking architectures. This was developed as a GPU interconnect. So it is, you're scaling this with each generation. So it's, it's always being updated with each generation of NVIDIA technology. Correct. Because again, you build a data center. Okay. You don't build components and try to assemble that. You build a data center and workloads change, the scale change. Inferencing brings demands, new training models bring demands. And that's why you see an annual cadence of data centers, but it's a data center that needs to support those workloads. And therefore, in that data center, you want to improve the compute side. You want to improve the way that you connect the compute side because you want to build the larger GPUs. It's not just, by the way, the GPU and NVLink, it's also the scale out infrastructure that is being updated on annual cadence. There are new super NICs that connect to the scale-out infrastructure. There are new switches that are, are, are doing that work. Every year, essentially, there is a new data center with a complete new 6A6, let's say, GPU, CPU, there is NVLink, there is super NIC, there is the switch, and then there is the DPU that essentially provides a secure access or storage access to that AI supercomputer. Yeah, I kind of laugh when you say Super Nick just because, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if this is Super Nick's, what's the next generation? <laughs> <laughs> A better Super Nick. <laughs> but uh, the interesting, because as we go to scale out, you guys are supporting Ethernet, you're supporting InfiniBand, but most importantly, you're supporting uh, whatever that preferred interconnect is, which is obviously going towards optical and going towards, even more importantly, going to co-packaged optics to make them more reliable uh, reduce the cost, reduce the size, and everything else. So, but you guys are willing to support pretty much any architecture or any, um, I should say, network technology or protocol for that type of interconnect, correct? Yeah. So let, let let's look on on that in this way. It's it's same as why we did Envelink Fusion. Yeah. We designed the entire data center, and we built something that we think is the most effective to support AI workloads, training, or inferencing. Now, one can choose to take the full design, the full reference architecture. One can choose to use components out of it and, and use it with other technologies, for example. So with NVLink Fusion, you can bring your own CPU or your own accelerator. You can choose to use NVIDIA GPUs and, and bring a different NIC or a different switch for that connectivity. You can play with those building blocks. Mm -hmm. Everything is standard. Everything has standard interface. We believe in open source. There is a lot of open source software that we're running on top uh, of our infrastructure because that's actually, actually enable our customers to innovate on top of that. So there is the full flexibility that people can take whatever component they, they choose. If someone wants to mimic the performance that we get, because there is a purpose for why we design a data center, of course, they can take the entire reference architecture. <laughs> Okay. And now we have, you've introduced a new term, and that is scale across. So you want to talk about that a little bit, you know, connecting yeah. data center to data center? Yeah, there, there are two things that are coming next, which both of them are exciting. The first one you mentioned, which, which is co package optics, mm -hmm. right? The data centers, the AF factor is increasing scale. 
very small bandwidth that is required for the scale-out infrastructure. And since scale-out infrastructure depends on distance, it relies on optical connectivity. Optical connectivity consumes power. Mm -hmm. And in large data centers, the power of the optical connectivity on the scale-out network can go always to 10% of compute. So if you can reduce the power, you can improve compute density, you can get a better AI, AI data center. So the way to do that is bringing silicon photonics, yes. or building switches which are co-packaged with silicon photonic engines. And, and the idea is very simple. When you do optical connectivity, there are transceivers with optical engines. It's an external transceiver to the switch, and therefore you need to support moving the signal from the silicon photonic engine all the way to the switch itself. Yeah. It needs to move through multiple substrate. There is a distance, which means you need to invest power and you need to deal with the signal integrity and so forth. With co-package optics, we're essentially moving that silicon photonic engine or the optical engine from outside the box to be next to the switch. Yes. So you need to invest much less power to drive it. And essentially the signal integrity is much higher. Now, we, there was a huge amount of innovation around that because we created new silicon photonic or new optical engines, which are really small micro-ring modulator based on micro-ring modulator. So it can support high radix switches, packaging innovation with the SMC, five bar arrays mm -hmm. innovations with an ecosystem. And we built something that reduced power cons consumption of the scale-out network by 3.5x and improved the resiliency of the data center and so forth. So that's one element that comes next. The second one that you mentioned is scale across. So we all know about the scale up infrastructure, scale up dimension, and there is scale out dimension, but there are physical and power constraints when you build a data center, mm -hmm. which limits how much compute you can essentially build. And we know that now there is workloads that requires more than that. So how do you do that? You need to connect multiple data centers together which could be on campus, between campuses, between sites, between cities, you know, long distance. Now, off-the-shelf Ethernet today mm -hmm. does not support long distance for distributed computing workloads. No. Off-the-shelf Ethernet today for long distance is based on the buffers, yeah. shock observers, because you run the long distance, there is no good congestion control or adaptive routing, so you need a shock observer to hold data in case you cannot progress. When you fill a shock observer, draining that shock observer has huge penalty. The jitter penalty of that shock observer can be even more than the latency penalty across the long distances. So it's not the right solution for distributed computing. And that's why we created Spectrum XGS Ethernet, which is based on the Spectrum X Ethernet infrastructure but introduce net new set of algorithms. It's a distance aware load balancing, distance aware congestion control. So whenever there is a data that goes, if it, if it runs within a data center, it has congestion control, noise isolation, adaptive routing that fits inside the data center. Once you go across, there is distance aware algorithms, a different set of algorithms. And that's enable actually us to connect data centers with minimal latency, you still need to pay the latency of the distance, oh, yeah. but you don't want to pay more than that. Eliminating GTR and our testing showcase that we can increase nickel performance by 1.9x running on Spectrum XGX Ethernet compares to off-the-shelf Ethernet that is used for other applications for long distance. I would assume that, you know, there's definitely modifications to the protocol stack also. You know, especially if you're making that a de deterministic connection. So right. So for example, there is uh, advancement that made for RDMA. Yes. Because there is RDMA within a data center, and now there is RDMA that needs to load the long distance stuff. Yes. So there is a modification done to the RDMA protocol itself. There is a modification that done for the adaptive routing. There is modification of the congestion control. It's all based on Ethernet. So it's full interoperable. It's full Ethernet, it's connected to any Ethernet device. But the way that it's implemented, the algorithms of doing that load balancing, the algorithm of moving the data across, the algorithm for making sure that there is no congestion, there is no hotspots, this is the secret sauce of Spectrum XGS Ethernet. No, that's, that's incredible. Um, 
looking at what we're doing with all this technology, it's, it's amazing. And that actually excites me because, I mean, building data centers right now is one of the biggest bottlenecks. It's taking, you know, the minute you say you want a new data center, okay, the clock starts ticking. And the, the longest things are designing the cooling, the power, and the networking. They're going to go in that data center, which can take multiple years. So, I mean, if we can go to modular solutions, whether it's like a shipping container or, you know, an uh, IT house or whatever, you know, this networking connection allows you to put these almost anywhere and allow, allows you to create that distributed solution very quickly. Right. So you can go and actually build data center where you have power and space. Exactly. And you're not limited on where it's going to be, knowing that you can connect those data centers and be able to run workloads across those two sites. Yes, you're fully correct. Completely so, and, correct. and the funniest thing is, is in one of the presentations yesterday, was talking about AI workloads and the fact that how it's stressing out the networks, you know, with the standard enterprise workload is maybe 50% uh, uh, load on a network where um, an AI workload can be 95% or 100%, you know, of the network stress. I mean, are we going to be able to keep pace with that? I mean, you guys are advancing GPUs, uh, memory is advancing, everything's advancing. You know, can the network keep up with AI? Well, the network must keep up with AI because <laughs> essentially the network is what makes AI AI, right? The, the, the compute engines are compute engines. Mm -hmm. The way that you connect those compute engines will determine what that data center will be. It could be a server farm. It could be an AI supercomputer or AI factory. So the infrastructure must progress. And that's why you see all the work in the ecosystem, all the work in the industries. There's many companies that come in with different ideas. And it, it's great to see that. And, and we, we love to work with the ecosystem. So mm -hmm. ecosystem is great. We love to work with them. If there is interesting things or great ideas, we'd love to bring it into um, the, the elements that we build or design with others. But yes, there is a big focus on the infrastructure. That's, that's the key thing. Yeah. That's why the cadence of infrastructure, it's an analog cadence. Same as you have analog cadence on new computing engines, there is annual cadence for the infrastructure. Well, and what's impressive is that you guys are investing at the data center level, and it's not just in the hardware, but it's in the entire software stack that goes on Correct. top of it. And that's an important aspect of, of it. Of course. You know, it's, it's the hardware, it's nice, but it's the software that actually make it work, right? The software that does all the orchestration, all the libraries on top. So you have the libraries, you have the, the frameworks on top, you have the workloads that runs on top of that. There is a huge amount of software that is being developed of top, on top of that infrastructure. You know, I love to work to talk about the hardware stuff, but there is a huge amount of software elements on top of that that actually bring that magic to life. So I have to ask you, is NVIDIA a hardware company, a software company, a data or a company. data center company? A computer <laughs> <Okay>. company. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a computing company. Yeah, I, I like the way Jensen refers to it as an infrastructure company. Uh, Correct. That, that gets kind of dangerous. <laughs> Are we going to build roads? No, just kidding. Uh, but We're no, actually building roads. You know, the network is essentially <laughs> okay, roads, okay. right? We're building and, roads. And, and you steer traffic. That's what you do. Instead of cars, is you know, packets. But you, you, deal, you build roads. Yeah, it is amazing. So... Gilad, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, especially giving us a, a dive on um, the networking architecture and what we're seeing. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it is amazing what we're seeing and, and the performance and the aspects and everything else. So thank you very much. Thank you for talking with me this morning.